and I hope you see it as a, a privilege and a, a glorious treasure that is ours. This morning's theme comes from 2 Corinthians 8, 9, which describes, um, well, I'll just read it. You can read it with me. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. The theme this morning is meekness. Now, it, you might not seem very apparent how this relates to meekness or the gentleness of Christ. You know that the word gentle means strength under control, and I thought of bringing that out when I designed this service, but we've heard that many, many times, and I hope and trust by now you understand that, that meekness is the ability to crush, but the will not to, and the ability not to. Yet this, 2 Corinthians 8, 9, is meekness in, in action. So this is meekness as a verb. This is the verbal aspect of meekness. When you think of, of ministry, I'll, I'll describe my own personal life, unless I uh, um, act as if you are like me. Um, I have had the opportunity to minister in situations where people are stinky and dirty and unlovely. And um, I will honestly say that my, um, I was revulsed at times and I felt I didn't want to touch. I felt dirty. Um, I didn't want to hug. I felt dirty. Um, and so I ministered like this. I was afar. Um, I didn't want to go where they were and be what they were to minister to them. And a facet of Christ's meekness is his ability to stand in the presence of a sinner and not, and not destroy it's the ability to, to be in the presence of a bruised reed and not break it. That's something that, that, that goes beyond our natural capabilities. It's the ability to be in the presence of a smoldering wick, dealing uh, with it and not putting it out. And in this case, it's in 2 Corinthians 8, it's the ability to not just minister to the poor, but be himself becoming poor, and we're not talking the inner city poor. This is talking about you and me, impoverished spiritually, unable to give anything to God. That's the idea on the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the poor in spirit. He became poor that we through his poverty might become rich. What a great and awesome Savior we have. Gentle, able to destroy. I mean, just one word. He could have snuffed out this entire world. But yet, he ministered in such a way as to condescend to our level and um, not frighten us, not break us in a way that we ought not to be broken, not destroy us, not uh, condemn us, and yet raise us up. Now, the day will come he will condemn. But in working in the lives of his people and his future people, he is gentle and kind. Let's bow before this Lord who was so willing to dirty his hands to, to come and minister to you um, as a facet of his gentleness. Let's pray and, and then we'll enter into his presence to worship him. Let's pray. Father, what a delight it is this morning to, to come to a being who, Lord, we might be repulsed by the things we see or smell or touch we thank you, O oh God, Lord Jesus, that you were not. We think that a dirty or a stinky or smelly individual is something that we couldn't stoop to. And yet, Lord, that is not a sin necessarily. But we were sinful. And it's to that um, people you came and did not destroy, did not condemn, but you redeemed. And saved us. Such that today we call you Lord. We call you Savior. Lord we thank you for being our gentle God. We thank you not only were you gentle in your first advent. But in the, in the outworking of the sanctifying work of the spirit of God. You remain gentle such that we're not crushed. Or overburdened by our remaining sinfulness in our flesh. In fact, so much so at times we can find ourselves arrogant towards other people. 
Father, thank you for your grace that stoops. We love you, Lord, and pray you'd be honored this morning. You'd uh, prepare us, unite our hearts to, to worship you well and to genuinely adore you and give you glory and your worth because of your meekness. This we pray in Jesus' name. Please pray further in, pre in preparation. God has ascended with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our King, sing praises. For God is the King of all the earth, sing praises with the skillful psalm. Brothers and sisters, it's our privilege this morning to come and indeed heed that call and to sing praises to our God. Let's do that using hymn number seven, from all that dwells below the skies, hymn seven. Let's stand. From all that dwell below the skies, let the Creator's praise arise. Let the Redeemer's name be sung through every land by every in every land begin the song to every land the strains belong in cheerful sound all voices raise and fill the world with joyful praise eternal art your mercies, Lord, eternal truth attends your word. Your praise shall sound from shore to shore, till sun shall rise and set no more. Let's pray together. Lord Almighty, we bow before you, thanking you for being our great and awesome God, who is indeed different, other than anything and everything we could ever comprehend. You are holy, holy, holy God, before whom morally pure angels bow before and sing it and say it, because you are so awesome. Lord, in your greatness, this world is but a drop. Not just this, this, this planet, but the universe and the, the universe is beyond. God, you are awesome. And yet you have deigned to dwell with the lowly. And in that dwelling, Lord, you have not broken the um, burning flax. Lord, we thank you for being such a gentle God such a kind God, and yet such a decisively great God. We bow before you this day and we adore you and thank you for bearing along with us, your people. We give you the glory this day in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Please be seated. As you're being seated, please turn in your bulletin to the section on we confess our sin. And together we will confess our sin.
It's appropriate in a corporate body to corporately pray in a corporate environment. This is not an individual time to worship God. I hope and trust you've done that Monday through Saturday, individually as a family. But this is the time for the body of Christ to corporately worship God. And so it's appropriate for us to use corporate amens. You hear the, the prayer prayed. It's not my prayer. It's our prayer. And it's appropriate to, to corporately give and to corporately sing and to pour a, a corporately fellowship. And this morning, we're going to corporately confess our sin. Now, this confession will obviously it cannot and will not cover what needs to be confessed by you. So we will spend time for silent, personal time of confession where you can make personal your confession of this morning. But this morning, let's at least first corporately go and confess our sins together before our God. Let's pray. We confess to you, Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that we have grievously sinned in thought, word, and deed. Forgive us through Christ Jesus. Make us truly contrite. Fill us with holy fear. We ask you to restore our souls in Jesus Christ, that we may be merciful and kind, even as you are. Let your forgiveness make us willing to forgive all wrong which we have suffered. Give us the spirit of our Lord Jesus Christ, who dwelt among men, and yet was meek and lowly of heart. Let the mind be in us, which was also in him. Grant that the hearts may be tender to all need, and our hands give freely for your sake, that being rooted and grounded in the mystery of the Son of God, being made flesh for us, we may receive power to overcome the world through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please pray further. Father, your word is very clear. You called us to be compassionate and gracious, and we have received compassion and grace. In fact, Lord, you say in Matthew 9, go and learn what this means. I desire compassion and not sacrifice. Lord, we know how important worship is to you, and if that, is, if, if that passage is true, we know that it is, that we know that, that, that you call us to have a, even a higher view of compassion and grace than we do worship not to diminish worship in any way. And yet, Lord, that's the very area that we find ourselves struggling as sinners. Father, you have forgiven us so much, and we would, we would confess it's a legion what you have forgiven us, and yet we have the gall to hold a brother or sister because of one or two or three hundred sins. Thank you, Lord, that in your humility and grace and meekness, you, you were willing to suffer along with us. And not just suffer along, but suffer with regards to all our sin. Forgive us, O oh Lord, for the arrogance which would, which would view ourselves in some way savable and be grateful for that. But then to look at a brother or sister and have the arrogance to, to look down upon them and to not stoop. Lord, we confess this has been true of us and our families, our relations with one another as a church family, in our disposition towards the lost, towards a president or a people. Father, thank you for your grace. Give us the grace to likewise be gracious. Thank us. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for your mercy. Give us the grace to be merciful. And Lord, we thank you for your meekness. Give us the grace as well to have strength under control. And so adorn the gospel by our love for you and our love for one another. God, this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Family of God, listen to 
the words of Psalm 48. We have thought on thy loving kindness, O Lord, in the midst of thy temple. Let Mount Zion be glad, for such is God. This passage says, man, when we meditate upon God's loving kindness and his grace, it just makes us want to be glad, because that is who you are, O Lord. Family of God, God is a gracious being. He is, he is merciful and kind. If you confess your sin, relying upon Christ's cross work alone for your forgiveness. I can assure you on the authority of Psalm 48 that your sin is forgiven. It's removed as far as the east is from the west. So great has he removed your sin. Isn't that delightful? We are a forgiven people today, spotless, pure before him. Let us respond this morning with glorious praise and adoration and thanksgiving as we muse upon the fact that Jesus Christ paid it all. Turn with me to hymn 308. Him 3008. And let's stand. I hear the Savior say, Your strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me your all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Lord, now indeed I find your power and yours alone can change the leper spots and melt the heart of stone. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain he washed it white as snow. For nothing good have I whereby your grace to claim. I'll wash my garments white in the blood of Calvary's Lamb. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. And when before the throne I stand in him complete, Jesus died my soul to save, my lips shall repeat. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Amen. Please be seated. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. This is, you'll recognize this, uh, well, it says so in your bulletin, obviously, but in First Peter, and, and uh, it's a, a large, more largely, it's a description of our Lord on the cross doing his work, and um, this is one of my favorite short passages in all of Scripture. Um, when I do marital counseling, I always include this passage as part of homework and as a part of meditation. Um, and I'll tell you why. 
because the marriage relationship is meant to depict or picture Christ and the church. And, um, and you put that together with some other things uh, that our Lord has said. They will know you by your love for one another. Uh, it it uh, becomes obvious when you read this and when you think and you meditate upon this, uh, that this is meant to characterize uh, who we're to be. That is to say, we're, we're the, we're the uh, covenant community. If, if we're anything, the centrality of who we are is a covenant community. And this passage characterizes what a covenant community looks like. So this characterizes what we're to be. That is to say, gentle, and we can be very lexical. At the beginning of our worship services, when we talk about our, the attributes, gentleness, compassion, understanding, we, have, we, 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 we do those things in preparation for our worship service. And we can be lexical about that, and by that, by that I mean we can be pretty word-centered about that. But at the end of the day, those words mesh together to form a picture of the covenant community. I'll suggest to you that what Christ is doing on the cross here is sort of a smash-up, to use current terminology, a smash-up, a roll-up of what it looks like for the covenant community to, to project itself both to, to one another and to the world. We're to look like this. In our relationships, we're to be gentle to one another, understanding, compassionate. We're not to spit back. That's the Lord judges. We're to be compassionate towards one another, understanding and forbearing, another great word. So I would encourage you, and, and by the way, as we're doing that, that's how we are giving ourselves up as a burnt offering, which is dedication, burnt offering to our Lord. So as the plates are passed, my encouragement to you and to me is to keep this before us such that in all of our dealings, uh, whether there are thoughts that we may have, whether there are interactions that you and I may have with one another, uh, our deeds, whatever we do, say, do, and think in this life, particularly with one another, but also with the world, that we might be characterized as Christ is characterized and not reviling back when somebody spits in your face, but rather to know that judgment will come from the judge, not from us and that we're to portray the character of Christ as he portrayed himself on the cross. Men, please serve us. Let's pray together. 
Father, we're grateful uh, to be reminded, to have even an opportunity to dwell and to ponder um, your character, and in particular this morning, your gentleness and your compassion and your forbearance. Uh, oh God, it's our prayer that we would manifest this in our lives, uh, but we're grateful for the Word of God, which makes clear what your character is, and uh, that we're to follow after you. We're to follow in your steps. Uh, of suffering. We're to follow in your steps, uh, striving to emulate your character uh, to, to you, to our brothers and sisters, and to a lost and dying world, that you might gather up the nations uh, for that day that shall come quickly. Uh, but Father, until then, and with great confidence, uh, we rest in you, knowing as we've been uh, reminded and participated in confession this morning, that uh, we can lay our burdens before you with confidence knowing that you hear us, you sympathize with us, um, and that there's nothing you can't relate to in our lives uh, as you care for us and as you encourage us through all the means which you've established, beginning with the means of grace more properly and, and uh, through the people of God and the relationships we have as the covenant community. Oh God, may we strive to build that community in and amongst one another, to be encouragers and to uh, see one another, uh, certainly through the lens of truth and dogma, but that it may reveal itself in a love and a compassion for one another, as you have demonstrated for us on your cross. And so this morning, as we uh, do lay our burdens before you, uh, there, are, there are people and there are things that come readily to mind. And while we certainly won't cover all of these in this prayer, this time of prayer, we certainly hoist these before you with great confidence that you hear us and that you act and that you use prayer to accomplish many and mighty things. And uh, so it's, it's with that that we do set these things before you. Uh, Father, we, we have those who are sick amongst us or ailing in a variety of different ways, some known, uh, some not. Certainly, we pray for John and his recovery with his surgery, for Carolyn as she aids him in that recovery and, and uh, loves him. Uh, Father, for others who have physical maladies in this congregation, uh, we pray that you would uh, provide them certainly with quick recovery, but use these maladies, oh God, these these times of physical pain to remind us and them of the pain which you endured, which wasn't necessarily physical, but was spiritual when you were separated from the Father and you took on the burden of sin of the world uh, and that uh, we are mortal, that we are finite, that we will die in this life and uh, short of your uh, coming and uh, that we have that to look forward to. So. Uh, we pray that you would encourage these folks, certainly others with other kinds of, of maladies, um, um, mental, physical, emotional, depression, oh God. Amongst us, there are many who suffer from uh, bouts with uh, depression or self-injury or those things we don't talk about very often, oh God, and that sometimes none of us know about other than that person. We pray that you would raise them up and encourage them with the truth and with brothers and sisters <clears throat> such that uh, we, they, would be encouraged through these times to rise up and to be more than a conqueror and to uh, walk as a soldier of Christ. And while limbs may be dangling and we may be uh, suffering from injury, uh, in this world in a temporal way. Nonetheless, it is our desire to be a soldier of yours and to take the gospel uh, to one another and take the gospel to the nations. And, and while we're uh, stumbling in that effort, uh, we pray that you would go before us and defeat the enemy in a practical way such that you would use our words and our actions to promote your character uh, to the nations. Uh, Father, we pray for uh, uh, certain battlegrounds like marriage and relationships, parenting in our, uh, with our children and the children of this congregation. Uh, Father, we pray for uh, two new marriages, uh, certainly 
Richie and Lisa, but also Wesley and Elan. We pray that uh, you would uh, take these, uh, these four people um, and meld them to their spouses in a way that would project and portray your relationship with the church. We pray that you would preserve them, uh, protect them from temptations as they will no doubt come their way. Uh, and cause them to always have a desire to reflect you in their marriage, to encourage one another, and to um, look to you as the centerpiece of their relationship. Father, we pray for those who are struggling with jobs, uh, certainly Steve Musto, uh, struggling with the very last portion of his exam, and uh, Father, he'll be taking that exam again here in a few weeks. We pray that you would uh, further uh, prepare him for that exam such he would pass and, and that he would have a job indeed uh, to provide for his family. Uh, Father, Father, we pray for um, Kelly and, and uh, uh, others uh, who are uh, struggling and, and searching, uh, who are maybe underemployed or unemployed and looking for other opportunities. Father, we pray not only that you would provide those opportunities, but you would encourage them in the pilgrimage of doing so and cause them to rely upon you. Father, there are others in this congregation who are sick, others who are struggling with jobs, um, others who are otherwise, uh, in some sense and in some way, may feel disenfranchised. Well, oh God, show them that they are franchised. They're part of this franchise called the Covenant Community. And to not forsake it, but rather to look toward it uh, and to give themselves up, that they might be encouraged uh, in their relationship with you. Oh, God, uh, the substance of things in this, these plates, uh, we pray you would appraise as a desire and an expression to you to use us all, to burn us up for your kingdom's cause and purpose, uh, that you might come quickly. We pray this in the name of our gentle and just Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Let's close out now this portion of our worship service we call dedication, but really just a very simple way of saying to our Lord, we know you possess us, we know you purchased us, use us. That's, that's what we're saying. Well, let's, let's say that as we, uh, as we pray, uh, singing passionately hymn 609 together, hymn 609. Please stand with me. Why should loss and trial me? Christ is near with his cheer. Never will he leave me. Who can rob me of the Son, for my own, to my faith have given. God oft gives me days of gladness. Shall I grieve if he give seasons to have sadness? God is good and tempers ever. All my hill and he will hold me, leave me never. Death cannot destroy forever. From our fears, cares, and tears, it will not deliver. It will close life's mournful story. Make a way that we may enter glory. Lord, my shepherd, take me to thee. Thou art mine, I was thine, even ere I knew thee. I am thine, for thou hast bought me. Lost I stood, but thy blood free salvation brought me. Thou art mine, I love and own thee, light of joy.
joy ne'er shall I from my heart dethrone thee. Savior, let me soon behold thee. Face to face may thy grace evermore enfold me. And all of his people said, Amen. Please be seated. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the twelve, Do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. It's obvious to Peter. It should be just as obvious to us that our Lord is indeed is our Savior. He's our Lord. He's the one we've been called, purchased by, and to follow. And to follow him is to listen to him. And we do that as we engage ourselves in the Word of God. So I would encourage you now, listen and be a doer as well. Amen. Family of God, turn your Bibles perhaps one last time to Daniel chapter 12. We will fellowship together around this wonderful prophecy that God gave to his people over the course of a lifetime. Daniel chapter 12, 5 through 13, the remainder I've called the lingering questions answered on this last vision that God gave Daniel in Daniel 10 through 12, which closes out this incredible prophecy, Old Testament epistle. We began looking at it last time, and we'll pick it up this time where we left off and hopefully finish it. Next week, we're going to begin a series in Thessalonians. So we'll take a break from the prophets. Um, so if you've been studying Ezekiel diligently, I'm glad. If you have not... Um, Shame on you. Um, what else would you say? I don't know what to say. But we will go to Thessalonians. So please start looking at Thessalonians. Buy commentary on it. Study it together. And uh, we'll, we'll dive into that next week. Daniel chapter 12, 5 and following. Let's read this God's word. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of a king. And in the ancient world, when a king spoke, he stood. Anytime he made a proclamation. So it's appropriate for us to stand at the reading of this, his word. Let's please stand. Hear now the word of our Lord. Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, two others were standing, one on this bank of the river and the other on that bank of the river. And one said to the man dressed in linen who was above the waters of the river, How long will it be until the end? Of these wonders. And I heard the man dressed in linen who was above the waters of the river as he raised his right hand and his left toward heaven and swore by him who lives forever that it would be for a time, times, and a half a time as soon as they have finished shattering the power of the holy people. All these events will be completed. As for me, I heard but could not understand. So I said, my Lord, what will be the outcome of these events? And he said, go your way, Daniel, for these words are concealed and sealed up until the end time. Many will be purged and purified and refined, but the wicked will act wickedly. And none of the wicked will understand, but those who have insight will understand. And from that time on, the reg or, I'm sorry, and from the time that the regular sacrifice is abolished, and the abomination of desolation is set up, there will be 1,290 days. How blessed is he who keeps waiting and attains to the 1,335 days. But as for you, go your way to the end. Then you will enter into rest and rise again for your allotted portion at the end of the age. Thus far, the reading of God's word. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the privilege of 
having open Bible in our laps today. The wherewithal to study it and understand it. The health of the Lord to endure it. And then the grace of the Spirit of God to apply it. God, we pray, give us the grace not to look lightly upon these graces, but to indulge in them and to be changed by them. Father, we commit this time to you now. Feed us richly on this book, on these words. and Grow us into the image of Jesus Christ for your glory and prepare us for the eternal way to glory that rests before us. God, we pray you would indeed use this unto your glory and our gazing upon you, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Please be seated. Never forget the time in seminary I heard a lecture on the kingdom of God. And up to that point in my life, I had never heard its, its implications. I've never heard its significance and a whole much more that was shared in that lecture. And I remember um, being moved, being um, literally moved at what I was hearing from God's Word. When the class ended, I remember sitting there with, with hundreds of questions, hundreds might be a little strong, at least teens of questions coming into my mind, rushing in, as it began to contemplate the, the implications of what it means to, for God to have a kingdom. I remember people getting up and leaving, and I just sat there in my desk, staring at my notes, formulating thoughts and questions. I can't help but to wonder if that's how the angels and Daniel res- were responding to the vision that they saw in Daniel. Recall Daniel 10 through 12 is the last vision. It was, it was not intended for Daniel's generation. Do you remember that? Daniel 1 through 9 was given to his generation who were exiled, strangers, aliens, living in a foreign land um, without a kingdom, without a physical kingdom, without a physical nation. But then we come to chapter 10 through 12, and we see that this prophecy was given not for his generation, but for those living in the last days. And that's our generation. So Daniel deigned, God deigned to give us this passage and intended it for us. You say, well, Greg, that's true of all scripture. I know, but, but, but this is a passage that was written with you in mind, only us in mind, this age, not for Daniel's age. In it, he described, as you recall, it, 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 there's through a variety of different prophetic tools that he uses, one of which are compound prophecy of Daniel chapter 11, all these very specific, datable, um, definable prophecies of which no one debates, liberal, dispensational, orthodox, reformed, no one debates what, that, that these events are referring to the events in history, so detailed. But all of this is a preparation for the last revelation, which is 1136 and following, where it then focuses on the culmination and the reason for this last section, and that is detailing the reign and the evil reign and rule of Satan, the persecution and attacks that he would perpetrate in the name of his evil empire to attack and destroy Christ's bride because he can't get to to Christ. And yet we saw that that at the worst possible time, if you look at 1140 through 45, this horrible news, we come to chapter 12 where we are then introduced for, uh, uh, for the first time in the Old Testament. First time. An unveiling of the plan of God to have the Messiah come, destroy, decimate, ruin the works of Satan. Now that we saw in Genesis 3. But ruin the works of Satan. Take Satan, his helpers, the demons, and all his followers, cast them into the lake of fire. Resurrect his people, transform them, glorify them in their bodies, and bring them into a new heavens and a new earth. First time proclaimed in the Old Testament. That's the vision. 
Now, you can imagine if you were watching that for the first time, whether you were a man or an angel, you'd probably have a lot of questions. What I just described about the second coming of Christ and the destruction of Satan and his powers and the, and the, and the lake of fire and the, the renewing of this earth and the glorified body and being brought into the eternal state, most of you, if not every one of you, have heard that before. So for us, we hear that and say, yeah, that sounds exactly what we read in the New Testament. But not for, not for these people. Hey, this raised so many questions. First, on the part of the angels, the first question that they asked was how long? The angels were saved. Perhaps because, think about it, before the fall, those angels were created for a purpose. But once the fall occurred, that purpose was modified, changed, to include protecting the people of God. So the angels are now embroiled, not, uh, not all of them, but some of them, some order of, of angels, are embroiled in a battle. We see that in Daniel chapter 11 and chapter 10, where, where, where this weaker angel Gabriel was not able to bring the answer to Daniel's prayer from God because this demon overseeing the region in which Persia lay was not allowing Gabriel to come and give the answer. Michael had to come and clear away the, the demon so that Gabriel uh, could come. Wow, these angels are engaged in something that God originally did not create them for. No doubt why they wonder how much longer until we can finish this era and go back to what we were doing before the fall. So, the, so the first question in this passage is by the angels. God, Lord, Jesus, how much longer will this age of sin and misery take place? And Christ's answer is, well, after an undetermined amount of time, as we saw last time, this is review, after an undetermined amount of time, it's going to end when, if you'll notice it there, the body of Jesus Christ is devastated. Their backs are against the wall. There's no hope that they're going to succeed. Notice the end of verse 7. And, um, and as soon as they finish shattering the power of the holy people, that's the body of Jesus Christ. We, saw, we read about them in 12.1, that there will be a time of distress as has never occurred since there was a nation until that time. How long is this era going to last? How long it's going to last until the body of Jesus Christ is devastated? Oh. Which means you've got a lot of work to do, angels. And my people, you've got a lot of suffering to go through. Because this world is not our home as we saw from the first part of daniel they were they were aliens and strangers and so have we become first peter chapter 1 verse 1 the body of jesus christ continue to live as aliens scattered in a world that is not our home where we will be persecuted and and um attacked well that aroused daniel's um curiosity so Daniel then comes and asks the second question, 8 through 10. This is review. He comes and says, what? God's people are going to suffer? That's how, I mean, this whole age, that's how it's going to end? And then he says, why? How come? God, why don't you just come now? Why don't you set up your messianic kingdom now? Why don't you reign over this world, an unfallen world now? Why must we wait? Why must it be that God's body has to be, has to be persecuted and attacked and miserably treated? And Christ answers that with a fourfold response, which I have tr transformed into Words of exhortation. I've given the therefore as a result. So notice the therefores. You've got them there in the outline. And we'll review them. One, uh, therefore we must be sober-minded as Christians. Well, why? Because notice the first phrase in verse 10. Many, speaking of Christians, and in, in contrast to the wicked, many, that is, uh, Christians, will be purged, purified, and refined. Oh, why? Why is God delaying? Because, brothers and sisters, God is purifying, He is purging, He is refining, He is tempering the body of Jesus Christ. 
know what the word temper means? You know what the word prove means? To prove something is to, is to, is to like metal, is to heat it, beat it, heat it, beat it, heat it, beat it, heat it, beat it, until it becomes hard. He's proving the body of Christ. That's what's going on in this era. You wonder why? 20, was it 20, the, 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 the body count, 2,300 people dead in Nepal because of an earthquake? And the, it's going to rise. Signs of the time going, what is God doing? He's tempering the body of Jesus Christ, preparing us that we might be fit to co-reign with God in the existence for which he ultimately created us. Family of God, can you have faith to believe that when you're, when you're struggling? Second one, we must not be shocked on account of the wickedness of man or the treachery that they inflict upon the child of God or each other. Why? Well, because notice the second phrase, the wicked will act wickedly. Another reason why we struggle in this world is because wicked people do one thing. They sin. This is a universalism, brother. Uh, this is a universal axiom. Sinners will sin. And when sinners sin, they manifest their sin in two ways towards other people. One, if other people are sinning with them, they compliment, Romans 1, 32. And although they know the ordinances of God, that those who practice such things, such as sin, are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but they also give hearty approval to those who practice them. You know what sinners sin, how they sin? If you sin with them, they're going to make you man of the year. They're going to compliment you and support you and be your friend and, and continue to hold you up. But if you choose not to sin, and if you're in the kingdom of God, you have chosen not to sin. If you choose not to sin... What does the sinner do? 1 Peter 4, 4. And all of this, they are surprised that you do not run with them in the same excess of dissipation, and they malign you. Sinners sin, and sinners will always persecute righteousness. They hate God, they hate righteousness, and they hate anything that stands for it. Why are we going through trial and difficulty in this land? Why does Islam have this passion to kill Christ or his followers? Because one, they hate God, and two... Because they hate righteousness. That's true of every non-believer. And thus we read of John 2 and the lesson. This is a review from last time. Jesus on his part was not entrusting himself to them, for man, to man. For he knew all men. Because he did not need anyone to bear witness concerning man. For he himself knew what was in man. One of our problems as Christians is we're living in our bubble of ease and, and comfort in the U.S. We look at our, Christian, our non-Christian neighbors who support us and help us, and, and we go, they're, 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 the, they're the ally. They're our friends. Our children grow up, and, and they meet non-Christians, and, and, and they go, they're nice people. They're nice people. What, 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 what's the problem? They are nice people by the grace of God called common grace preserving them. But the reality is sinners sin, and that's universalism. Sinners will always sin, and that is why we suffer. That is why we struggle. Notice the third axiom or the third therefore. Therefore, we must understand that wicked people won't understand anything and everything related to truth in God's kingdom. Now, this is new, new territory. This is where we ended last time. Notice the next phrase in verse 10. Many will be purged, purified, and refined. Secondly, but the wicked will act uh, wickedly. Uh, thirdly, and none of the wicked will understand. This doesn't mean that non-believers can't learn and can't be masters or doctors. That doesn't mean that non-believers can't master areas of study, whether it be medicine or physics or science or language or music or name it. But what it does mean is that no amount of learning on the part of a non-believer will get them one iota closer to understanding God, Christ, the Holy Spirit, His kingdom, Salvation, Christ's cross work, reconciliation, heaven, glory, all the teaching in the world, and they will remain ignorant to these things. So yes, our non-Christian neighbor may be nice and may be supportive because of God's common grace, 
but no amount of teaching will ever get them one infinitesimal um, um, uh, um, centimeter, whatever, closer to truth. In fact, we know from Romans 1, all of it will be a vehicle that they'll use in their sinfulness to run from truth. 1 Corinthians 2.14, But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them. He will never understand. Why is it that we are persecuted in this world? Because I mean, we can come and say, time out, time out, time out. I mean, we stand for helping this this, this nation, Christians in the United States who respond obediently to God's word will be blessers of any nation in which they live. Jeremiah 29, read it. Any nation they live, they were called to bless. First Timothy, pray for your leaders. Bless them, encourage them. So we can sit here and say, time out, time out. We're blessings to you. And they'll look at us and say, I wish you were gone. Kill the Christian. Why? Because the Bible says homosexuality is a sin. The Bible says adultery is a sin. The Bible says abortion is a sin. The Bible says your desire for pleasure is a sin. And he doesn't want you to have your sinful pleasure. Not ordained, but sinful pleasure. We become chief number one. They would rather live with people who would seek their ultimate demise than live with Christians. That is why we suffer. In fact, the, the, the picture is even worse. Ephesians 4, 18 through 19. Paul describes the non-Christian as, quote, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God. Get this. Because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. And they have become callous having given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. Family of God, the longer a sinner is on this earth and given over to his sin, the more callous he'll become to truth. That is why it is so hard for an elderly person to become a believer. Statistically, if you look at the statistics, statistics when people are saved, very few uh, percentage-wise are saved in their old age have given themselves to a life of sin, and thus they become calloused in their hearts. Why is it that we suffer? Well, we suffer because God is, is tempering us and purging us. We suffer because this world sins. They hate God, and we suffer because no amount of education, no amount of explanation, no amount of, of cultural reconciliation will ever get a non-believer to accept Christ or the truth and therefore us. They are hostile in their minds towards God and towards us. And we need to see this. This past week I thought of a story. You've seen a couple of them lately in the news. These families, they adopt a baby bow constrictor. And they're so cute and cuddly. I mean, you put them on your finger and they hug it. You ever see a bow? They, you know, a little tiny snake, they just curl around your finger. And the owner thinks... My, how much he loves me. And then that bow constrictor gets really big, and he curls around your entire body, and you go, he's loving me to death. Right? Recently in the, the news, some pet bow, you heard about the, the one, it, it fell through, through the ceiling of a person's apartment, and it killed one of their babies. Horrible story. Now, do we blame the bow constrictor? Do we look at that bow constrictor and say, kill it, wipe it out, because it's evil and wicked? Well, it may be fallen and subject to sin, but we don't. We, we blame the owners who think the bow constrictors are pets. Christian, when you get burned by non, non-believers, ought you to be shocked and surprised? No, what we should be shocked and surprised by is any Christian who thinks non-believers are their friends. Because you're going to get burned. That's the point here. So why is it hard Daniel says, God, why the suffering? He's given us three really good answers, and there's a whole lot more from Scripture. That brings us then to a therefore. It really doesn't answer why we struggle, but it sort of gives us a therefore. We must cast off all worldly thinking, plans, and motive, and so come to understand the message given to us here in Daniel. Notice with me verse 10, the very end. Many will be purged, purified, and refined. 
The wicked will act wickedly. None of the wicked will, uh, will uh, um, understand, but those who have insight will understand. Family of God, this isn't a hope or a dream or even a promise. It's a reality. Unlike the non-believer, God has opened our eyes to truth. Let me have you consider two verses. Turn there if you'd like. These were scripture memory verses, so the first time I heard them uh, united, it stuck in my brain pretty deeply. Ephesians 2, 1 through 3, you've got the verses there written in front of you. Ephesians 2, 1 through 3, listen to it, or you could follow along with me as I read. We read this, speaking... Um, of what we were before we came to Christ. Paul said, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working, the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging in the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. This passage indicates that the non-believer um, has a fallen mind. Their mind is enslaved to Satan, um, the word for mind there is uh, dianomai, and uh, um, I'm sorry, dianoia, and it is um, what is enslaved to Satan when a non-believer is born, when a person is, who's not saved exists. He's enslaved in his mind to Satan. It's fallen. It's dead. Notice then 1 John 5.20. John wrote, we know that the Son of God has come and has given us da'anoia. He's given us understanding. He, he has renewed our minds in order that we might know Him who is true, and we are in Him who is true, and His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. These passages indicate to us that in our fallenness, we do not understand. We don't have the mind to understand. It's enslaved to Satan. But following redemption, God renews our mind such that this is not a promise, but those who have insight will, uh, will understand. Those who have, who have insight is a, is a metaphor for Christians. Okay? Those who have insight, those who are saved, they will understand. So uh, therefore is, brothers and sisters, what we're learning here, what, what God prophesied to Daniel here, not just from 1136 through, through 124, but even about the suffering and the difficulty, God said, my people, are, they're going to grasp this and understand it. Isn't that incredible? In other words, what we've been preaching about is something that every one of you in this room should, in listening to it, who are saved, go, that's exactly what I already know. Preacher, you haven't told me anything new about the destruction of Satan's kingdom. The end times... The full revelation has been given. God's people who have insight, they have those eyes to see and ears to hear, they're going to understand this, which means they're going to see this world as not a friend of grace. They're going to understand that they're aliens and strangers. Family of God, if, if you're hearing this and you go for the first time going, wow, I didn't realize I was an alien and stranger, at least not in that way. Family of God, that should indicate to you you've been studying the wrong things. You've been immersing your mind, giving your mind to the wrong things. Because a characteristic of God's people in the last days is they're going to come to understand truth. And this very clearly, without any kind of equivocation, lets us understand that, that we are aliens and strangers. This world is not our home. It is not a friend of grace. Huh. And that therefore the providences of God are all designed to temper us and grow us and equip us and prepare us for that glorious day when we shall behold Christ face to face in a physical body. That's what this is all about. I love the words of J.R. Miller. We need, only eyes, uh, we need only eyes of Christian faith to find in every painful experience a helper to our spiritual lives. Precious gems of rarest blessings are enclosed in the roughest crusts of hardship, affliction, loss, and trial, which we are constantly coming upon in our life's way. We shall find when we get to our heavenly home that many of the things from which we have shrunk as evils have been the bearers to us of our richest treasures 
of good. Do you understand that's a definition of God's people, a Christian? A Christian is, is the only people in this world who can stand up and say, this was my sin. I'm an adulterer. I'm a homosexual. I'm a prostitute. But no longer. God redeemed me by the grace of Jesus Christ. Christians are the only ones who can say that and not fear saying that for what people will, say, will think about them. Sadly, the church has forgotten that. Today, we have plastic smile churches and plastic smile fellowships because we're afraid of the grace of Christ. We're afraid to let grace really be grace. We want grace to save us from acceptable sin, but not the unacceptable sin. And God's word says, Christians in the last days are going to understand reality. And they're going to see grace saves the greatest sinner from the greatest sin. From wh- Therefore, we ought not to be shocked. And ought not to be amazed. Wow. I love the words of Joachim Neander, who knows how to pronounce it. I want to say Joachim because of the world in which I live, but I know that's not how they had to say it in the 17th century. But you know the hymn. Praise to the Lord, who are all, over all things so wondrously reigneth. Shieldeth thee gently from harm, or when fainting, sustaineth. Is this not your testimony? Hast thou not seen how thy heart's wishes have been granted and what he ordains. Everything God's ordained in your life is for a purpose. And if you, if you can't say it now, and one day you will, I guarantee it, you'll look back upon this life and you'll see God's providence for what it is and realize, wow, it makes sense now why God did what he did. I don't understand. I will say this, brother, and say, I don't understand suffering. I don't. I don't, even, I don't understand. I, I love the, the story of Spurgeon who suffered with horrible bouts of gout. And at one time in lectures to my students, he shares this story where he was bedridden for two or three weeks, it went, unable to preach or teach or do anything, in horrible pain. And then it broke as soon as he prayed, God, if I was a parent, I wouldn't treat my kid the way you're treating me. I mean, that's where his pain brought him. I can identify with that prayer at times, can't you? God, why are you doing this? I don't understand. But we will someday. And you keep giving yourself to the word of God, and indeed one of the marks of a believer is he understands. And so the angel asks, Lord, how long? Answer, well, until the body of Jesus Christ is is pretty well beaten up. Um, How come? says Daniel, says the man. Why, Lord? Well, because it's about tempering us, and it's about the reality you're living in a, in a, in a land that's, that's filled with sinners who do not know me and do not love me and, in fact, hate you and hate me. And we'll never understand, no matter how nice you are to them and no matter how much understanding you give them. Now, that doesn't mean we don't share the gospel, and that does not mean we don't have a, a passion to help them understand, but we understand the only way they'll understand is by the grace of of the Spirit of God enlightening their eyes, Titus 3, 5 through 7. So we, know, we understand that. All right, well, then that brings us then the next question. Well, how now? i got to keep the house, okay? What now? How now? What should we do? How now? What, what, what's the therefore, Lord? Notice 11 through 12. And from that time, uh, and from the time of the regular sacrifice is abolished, and the abomination of, de- of desolation is set up, there will be 1,290 days. How blessed is he who keeps waiting and attains to the 1,335 days. Now, if it is our inclination to take these numbers literally, you are going to be in sad, safe, uh, sad and sorry shape. Because they correspond with nothing historically. And whether you are Reformed, Dispensational, Arminian, Calvinist, doesn't matter what your theological leaning is, everyone says who are Orthodox, no idea what these numbers mean. None. Well, let's look at them for a second. The text says there's going to be 1,290 days when the regular sacrifice is abolished 
and the abomination of desolation is set up. Now, we know the abomination of desolation, this was a prophecy that Daniel was, was given, and for him, this is another pr uh, prophetic tool. This was a dual prophecy or dual of uh, fulfillment. This is two images which are separate, but if you line them up and let the sun shine on them on the ground, the shadow will look like one image. And so Daniel looked down the quarters of time, and what he thought was one image, all he saw was the shadow of one, turns out to be two. The first one was the abomination of desolation, which occurred in 167 B.C., December 25th, by the way, Christmas. Well, we celebrate Christmas. 167 B.C., when Antiochus Epiphanes, seeking to unify his nation, we've already talked about this, recall, what did he do? He put his hand in a hat, pulled out Zeus. This will be the God my entire kingdom worships because his kingdom was filled with so many subcultures, so many sub-religions. He decided if we're going to have a, a solid stance against Rome and against the Ptolemies, we need to be one people, one voice, one mind, one everything. And so he said everyone must worship Zeus. And the picture of Zeus, the physical manifestation of Zeus pictured in idols was a pig. So he made every religion in his kingdom sacrifice a pig on December 25th, 167 B.C., and that was known as the abomination of desolation, where he sacrificed, he stopped the sacrifice, the sacrifices of God's people by sacrificing a pig. The problem is the sacrifice, the cessation of the sacrifices on the altar only lasted 1,080 days, not 1,290. So historically, that is not what Daniel had in mind here. Oh, well, there's another abomination of desolation. Matthew 24, 15 through 16. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel, the prophet standing in the holy place, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountaintops. So Christ says, when you see this future abomination of desolation, some post mills or post mills will say this occurred during uh, 70 AD. And if that's true, there is nothing datable to 1,290 days. Period. End of discussion. If this is something farther off, there's no prophetic indication in the Bible, if you're a Amil, of 1,290 days. It comports with absolutely nothing. So, whether you are dispensational, uh, reformed, or whatever, at this particular point, guess what you have to say? The numbers here are unknown, are symbolic, and represent an extended period of time of suffering. Exactly what we said in Daniel chapter 9. <laughs> so regardless of your eschatological view, when you get to Daniel chapter 12, you have to say the same thing we said in Daniel chapter 9, and that is undesignated time, a period over which God clearly is sovereign. Satan doesn't know how long this age is going to last. We don't know. Christ coming in the earth and the flesh didn't know. Only God knows. And that is 1,290-somethings. So what's the point? Actually, let me give you a quote first. Tremper Longman, what is the relationship of the 1,290 days to the 1,335 days, to the, 200, uh, to, to the 2,300 evenings and mornings, to the time, times, and a half a time? God alone knows, and that seems to be the point. God knows that there is an end that he has determined, but we cannot figure it out because we are not supposed to. Leave it to God, and the angel says unto Daniel, and through him he speaks to us. All right, so what are we to do? Well, it's not going to be answered by the understanding 1,290 days because no one understands that. Okay, let's get to the point then. So with what are we to do then? What's the point? Look at 11 one more time. From the time of the regular sacrifice is abolished and the abomination of desolation is set up, there will be 1,290 days. How blessed is he who keeps waiting. That's the point. For what seemingly sounds like three years, a little bit more than three years, which we know now is this undefined time of suffering. The call of the child of God is to keep waiting. The word for wait means to rely upon God over time. It's to trust. Wait and trust. You say, Has it, isn't that the same? They're different. Trust is momentary. Waiting is trust over time. Trust in the valleys. 
and the, secu- the securitous routes in which God's providence leads us. Trust and unswerving reliance and trust and dependence upon God. It's, it's what is referenced by Christ when he says in Matthew 26, keep watching and praying that you may not enter into temptation. Or Paul in Ephesians 6, having done everything to stand, stand firm. The idea is, what should we do? Family of God, endure in your trust. Don't give it up. It is so easy for us to allow the things of this world, just like Job, that's the whole, one of the whole points of Job. Many lessons, one of which is this. Man tends to interpret God by his providences. Job did that. He had bad providences. He hadn't changed. Therefore, God must have changed. Therefore, God must not be good. And the lesson of Job is, Job, you know nothing. Do not interpret who God is. Do not deduce your theology from circumstances. That's what non-believers do. Christians derive their theology from the revelation of God's character, which is his word. That's where we derive our theology, and that's from which we, we derive our trust. We trust in the goodness of God. Keep trusting, Christian. We trust in the holiness of God. Keep Trust and we trust in the in the providence, the sovereignty of God. Keep trusting. You will have discussions with Christians. And those discussions will either hinge on either making God this 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 far off sovereign despot or man the controller, the the uh, um, ruler of his fate. Isn't that where a lot of theology is balanced between? Right? Either we're gonna defend God or we're gonna defend man. God's word says, man, keep them both. And if you have to say, I don't know, say, I don't know. I don't know how God can be completely and totally sovereign such that our hope and confidence is knowing that the days of our lives is numbered. You all agree with that, right? Isn't that our confidence? Your days are numbered. I love that. Teach us to number our days that we might apply our hearts towards wisdom. But then to look upon the death of a loved one and to go, God, Why? Christian, isn't your delight in knowing your days are numbered? Well, so was theirs. God, God exalted them. He, he, he gave them a raise. He graduated them. Now, I don't know why. Why now? Why then? Why that way? We don't know, but someday we will. Daniel says, keep trusting. What an important exhortation for people of God who are going to suffer. Daniel knew it. And his exhortation to them is, don't stop Trusting. And then he goes beyond. <laughs> Notice with me verse 12. First, verse 11. From that time on, the regular sacrifice is abolished to the abomination of the desolation. It'll be 1,290 days. I mean, this is the era of suffering. 1,290 days. But how blessed is he who keeps waiting and attains to what? 1,335 days. What does that correspond to? No clue. But we know this, it's more than the era of suffering. The implication by this that Bible commentators all bring out is he's saying is, don't just trust by the hair of your chinny chin chin. Excel. Go beyond 1290. Go to a whole nother, uh, um, you know, 13, 35, 45 more days of trusting, holding on to the goodness of God, the sovereignty of God, the justice of God. The plan of God for your life. Christian, don't give it up. Whatever you do, no matter how much you suffer and how hard is your way, don't give it up. That's the idea. What should we do? How now, Lord? I know how long. I know now why. But what are we to do about it? Wait upon the Lord in and through all things. It's the same as Paul when he says, Rejoice, Lord, always again I will say, Rejoice. He's just saying it. Don't just rejoice, Christian. Rejoice. Right? But you just said that, Paul. Yeah. And I'll say it again. It doesn't bother me. And it's a benefit to you. Rejoice. Right? Same thing as having done everything to stand. Stand. But I am standing. Stand some more. You know, what do I do, Lord? Stand. I am standing. Keep standing. That's what you're to do. I love it. Paul, 1 uh, Corinthians 
1558, Therefore, my beloved, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing, unlike the non-believer, that your toil is not in vain. 2 Peter 3, Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found in him in peace. Listen to the words. Be diligent to be found in him. To be found in him is passive. But we're called to be active. We're called to actively labor to be found in him with, these, with this disposition, peace, spotless, blameless, regarding the patience of the Lord to be salvation. Deuteronomy 6, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or tremble at them, for the Lord your God is the one who goes with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. Now, if, if you're not waiting, if you're struggling with waiting, let me ask you, to, let me encourage you to ask five questions, and I'll bet in study hour we could ask a lot more. How do you cultivate this heart, this disposition of waiting on God? Just ask yourself a couple questions. Are you, is there any known sin in your life? If this isn't you, is there any known sin in your life that you're not repenting from? Secondly, are you in the Word of God? Are you, are you praying? Are you availing yourself of the table? Thirdly, have you come to understand grace? Do you understand the nature of God's amazing grace? Fourthly, what are you living for? Ask yourself that. If God could give you anything you could ever want based upon not how you feel today, but how you've been living, and be honest with yourself, what would that be that you would want God to give you? I want a degree. I want a better job. I want a better marriage. I want better parents. I want friends. I want all the things that the worldly wants, which is not bad. We're humans. But brothers and sisters, our track record must be we want to know Christ and make him known. Christ and him crucified. Uh, fifthly, are you fellowshipping with the body of Christ? Are you in fellowship with God's people? We go on and on and on how to attend, how to maintain, how to cultivate a disposition of waiting on the Lord. All right, that brings us to the last question. So, how long? How come? How now? And finally, how blessed? Notice the last verse, 12 and 13. How blessed is he who keeps waiting and attains the 134, whatever, 1335 days. All right, we've already talked about the 1335 days. Now let's look at the phrase, how blessed. You know what the word in the Hebrew means? It literally means, if you get this definition, it's great, especially when you take the definition, anointing Jesus is a Jew, and he gave the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor. The word blessed in the Hebrew, not the Greek, but the Hebrew means to be envied. The angels are watching us, Ephesians 3, Daniel 10 through 12. God is watching us. We're watching each other. And do you know what makes an angel go, look at that? Well, let me ask you, what makes you say, look at that? Well, if you're a disciple, you'd say, look what man built. Look at this temple. Wow, isn't man a great? If you're a man, you'll say, look at that car. Have you seen, if you haven't seen it, and you want to go, look at that, Look at the YouTube video of Michael Jordan's house that he built when he was playing for Chicago Bulls. It's a 15-minute video tour of his house. I called the entire family down and said, look at that. That's what we do. Angels aren't, they are not impressed with power. We look at someone who's strong and say, look, at, he can bend a thousand pounds. Look at that. Did you know God could raise up a stringy, skinny man named Samson who could probably outlift every weightlifter in the world. Why would God be amazed at strength? Wealth. He owns a camel on a thousand hills. We're amazed by those things. What is it that catches the eye of heaven? Do you know what it is, brothers and sisters? It's Christians enduring in faith, waiting on the Lord in the midst of trial. It's Romans chapter 4. I'm almost done. I, I realize I'm going to go over here a little bit. I want to finish Daniel. 
Romans 4.18, in hope against hope, speaking of Abraham, he believed against all odds. In other words, look at this. In order that he might become a father of many nations, skip to 19, and without becoming weak in faith, Abraham uh, uh, contemplated his own body, now as good as dead since he was 100 years old. Get this, he's 100 years old. He's been waiting 30 years. He understands he can never have a baby now. It's been too long. His wife's womb is barren. The deadness of Sarah's womb, even when she could have babies, she couldn't. Now she's 99 or something like that. Wow, yet with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief. Now get this, it goes, it, it, it gets, it's, the verse gets even better. But grew strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully assured that which he has promised, he was able also to perform. This passage indicates that the longer Abraham went without the answer to his prayer, the more he trusted God. Now you think it'd be the opposite. It, it, it wasn't. The more Abraham waited on God, get this, the more you and I as a Christian walk with God, or better yet, the more God walks with us through the valley of the shadow of death, we see the multifaceted character of God. And 20 years ago, we would have doubted, but now we don't because we see God for who he is. We're growing. Abraham, in 30 years, you think he sat down for 30 years and did nothing? Family of God, he interacted with God for 30 long years, watching God deliver him and bail him out and strengthen him and move the hearts of man again and again and again, never letting him down, always bearing him up. And over 30 years, when he didn't get one promise from God, he didn't grow weary. In fact, he grew strong. When that happens, angels sit up and go, wow. And so should you and me. That's what, if you're not saying wow to that, you and I need to, we were just talking about reprogramming our brains. Dave has a great, don't remember your, your phrase, Dave, so it's yours. But, you know, re, cha changing the way we think such that we would stop saying wow when, when wretched sinners make a lot of money, or Christians for that matter. But we say, wow, when Christians in such horrible circumstances endure. Now, tangibly, what is the blessing to be envied? Those who wait upon God, who gain new strength and mount up with wings like, wings like eagles. What, what is the tangible blessing? It closes with verse 13. You can read the quotes of Richard Baxter and Sinclair Ferguson. That was a, a moment of application we're going to skip. Notice verse 13. But as for you, Daniel, go your way to the end. Now, you've got to realize Daniel in the book of Daniel represents everyone. From the first chapter to the last, Daniel is the prototypical Christian and thus the pattern that God is giving to his people this time. So whatever is true of Daniel, we want to be true of us, Right? Get this. So whatever we read here is going to be true of us too. Daniel, go your way to the end. In other words, don't sell all your possessions and wait on a rooftop to be raptured. Just keep doing what you're doing. Christian, you don't have to, have to sell everything and go be a missionary overseas. Just be faithful in the land where God put you. And that may mean that you go and sell all your possessions and go overseas if God calls it. But that's not the call of everybody. That, and just go your way to the end. Sounds like the gathering demoniac, doesn't it? Lord, I want to follow you. What should I do? Jesus says, just stay. Stay and testify what happened. You don't have to follow us. So be faithful. Then, notice this, you will enter into rest. The Bible, this is the word for Sabbath. It is not the word Shabbat. It's, uh, it's, it's another word. Uh, Use in Exodus 20, 11 for the Sabbath. And we know in the Bible the Sabbath has, has two references. To the cessation of working to be saved. That's justification. Right? That's the first aspect. Hebrews 4, 1 through 5. The second aspect of the Sabbath is the cessation of fighting the good fight of faith. The cessation of living in a state of sin and misery as a Christian struggling to get by. That's the Sabbath rest that still awaits the people of God. And God tells Daniel here, Daniel, you just be faithful because you know what's going to happen at the end of your life? Sabbath. 
Revelation 6, 11, and there was given to them a white robe, and they were told that they should rest for a little while longer. Vera Vanderhorst's sister recently died. I can imagine the glory that came over her after the years of slow decline and suffering when God said, rest. No more tears. No more suffering. No more trial. That's what awaits us, brothers and sisters. Revelation 14, 13, I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Right, blessed are the dead and the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors. That's what awaited Daniel. And he entered that how many years ago? And that's what awaits you and I. Why are we envied? (laughs) Because we're trusting God over the long haul. And you know what happens if you trust in God over the long haul? You have the glorious rest that is yours in Christ. And then secondly, then you will rise again for your allotted portion. The word for portion there literally means to stand. I know the ESV has, and you will rise again and stand or something like that. You will rise again for your portion at the end of the age. The idea is both. You're going to rise again. You're going to stand before God Almighty on the last day, gaze upon him with unaided eyes because you'll be glorified and God will hand give you the kingdom of God and you and I will stand and receive it. That's what was promised Daniel and that's what's promised everyone in Christ. Wow, 70 years of suffering for eternally reigning with God like that? Amen, Lord Jesus. Come, God, come quickly. But until then, give us the grace to endure. So how long? Until the church is ravished. How come? Well, sinners sin and God is tempering us. How now? Endure. This is our passion and concern. How blessed awaiting us is rest and the inheritance of Christ. Family of God, that's what you should do in response to the glorious revelation given to Daniel. May God give us the grace to fellowship together and encourage each other to do just that as the day draws near. Let's pray. Father God, we confess that we are so myopic, so concerned about the passing of this world. And Lord, rightly so in many ways because this is your kingdom and this is your world. And so we ought to be concerned Father, we confess that our godly concern so often bleeds over to a sordid preoccupation with the things of this world, whether it be our health, our beauty, our relevance, our pleasures, our conveniences. Such that, Lord, because of this this little era of peace in which we live, We can be found as a people who look and sound and feel just like the worldling. Father, our our goal is not to look different. Our goal is not to be different. Our goal is to just trust you and love you and wait upon you. And so, Lord, our heart grieves when we look back upon time wasted. It grieves when we're preoccupied with the passing things of this world. It grieves, O Lord, when we look back as parents upon wasted years when we could have led devotions and and taught um, um, moldable minds only to have children now who, who will not listen. God, may we grieve no more. May we entrust our past, our present, and importantly, Lord, our future, what is left. Give us the grace to therefore go our way with the confidence that before us is the glorious kingdom of God the rest that is promised that will make every burden on this world seem light, and the inheritance that is ours that we shall enjoy forever, chiefly our love relationship with you. We love you, Lord. So we pray, grant Bethel Presbyterian Church the grace that as the day draws near to be transformed in this way by the renewing of our minds. We ask this in Jesus' name.